Is it picky eating or is it ARFID? On today's episode, we're joined by guest Rebecca Thomas, ARFID expert, who explains to us what ARFID is, the signs to look out for, and how it's treated. Welcome back to Feeding the Family with Dr. Kristen. I'm your host, Kristen Saxena. On today's episode, we're talking about the eating disorder ARFID. We're joined by guest Rebecca Thomas, who's a registered dietitian and nutritionist and ARFID expert. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Rebecca. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited. So you are, are you out of Maryland? Is that correct? I am about 20 minutes out of Baltimore around um, University of Medicine and Dentistry for Maryland and Johns Hopkins Hospital. So about 20 minutes out of Baltimore. Yeah. Okay. And you're a registered dietitian, nutritionist. You specialize in helping people with eating disorders. Yes. And um, specifically, you have a lot of interest or you do a lot of work with people who suffer from ARFID. Correct. Yes. I specialize in both pediatric ARFID and adult ARFID. Perfect. So that's why I was so excited to get you on our show um, because it's it's an eating disorder that, um, you know, I feel like it's newer on the scene, like it's kind of the new new kid on the block, if you will. Um, one that I don't think a lot of people um, in, in the world and certainly not even in like professional spaces maybe know a lot about. So ARFID stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Could you first maybe just tell us a little bit about what this is? Because I think a lot of us are just not that familiar with it. Yeah, sure. So uh, when we came into 2013, it's the first time that they actually made this diagnosis. Prior to 2013, people that showed evidence of maybe selective eating or picky eating as we would think it to an extent where it interfered with their growth or it interfered with their health or it interfered with their social um, dynamics were kind of categorized under like selective eating or a GI disease. So around 2013, the diagnostic criteria book from the American Psychiatric Association um, created this criteria of what ARFID would be. Um, So when we're talking about ARFID, we're talking about selective eating to the extreme, to the point where it's interfering with their growth, if they are a child or a teen, if it's interfering with their um, ability to maintain health, such as being at a healthy weight for them to function or being able to maintain and correct a chronic disease, um, and or if it's interfering with their psychosocial functioning. So avoiding situations where they would need to eat or major milestones such as like going to school or, you know, being able to hold a job because of the fear of eating. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is standing for. A lot of people with maybe selective eating or even kids with picky eating, which is a total natural phenomenon, are getting confused under, well, what actually is a criteria for ARFID? What is ARFID? And then what is picky eating? So if we think about those three major events, whether it's interfering with growth, if it's interfering with psychosocial functioning, or it's interfering with their ability to maintain health, then that would be considered something that may be an eating disorder and fall under that ARFID umbrella. Okay, so, well, what do you, and I know this is probably really difficult to estimate, but is there like an estimated incidence of ARFID? Yeah, because it only came out in 2013, we do have pretty limited data, but what we have been able to kind of gather over the years um, is that anywhere from 2 to 14% of the children that are diagnosed with some sort of eating disorder or pediatric feeding disorder do fall into that criteria. So it is very well, I guess, versed in the population when we're having trouble eating. Um, but a lot of people and a lot of kids are falling through the cracks because it is such a new diagnosis and not a lot of providers and not a lot of parents are familiar with the signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Well, and I was thinking, um, you know, kind of the criteria that you mentioned, uh, I think those make a lot of sense. 
you know, as a physician, those kind of things make sense. As you say, like, these are criteria for diagnoses. However, as I listen to that, I also think, you know, these are the concerns that parents often bring, even related to what we would kind of consider uh, developmentally normal picky eating or, you know, just sort of like not this extreme version of picky eating. You know, their concerns come, you know, I don't, I worry about their growth. I worry that they're not getting the nutrients that they need. Um, and so I think it can be hard. Plus, in my understanding, you know, you see a lot of times where the uh, foods that maybe people who are more selective choose to eat don't necessarily, maybe as opposed to other uh, eating disorders that we see aren't necessarily related to their caloric intake. Um, they're more related, it seemed a lot of times those foods that seem to be kind of uniform. Uh, or like I always say, you know, kids tend to like, pick your eating kids tend to like a lot more processed food because it's the same every time. And so I would, it seemed like those are kind of frequently the, the same foods that seem like safe foods to people with ARFID. And as a result, I could see it not being easy to detect the nutritional uh, deficiencies that these people or these kids have because you could probably maintain a pretty normal weight for a long, long time um, on, you know, bread and potatoes or whatever it, whatever it is those foods a lot of times are. So, um, you know, I, I guess my question is like, how do, how do we in real life pick these kids out or people yeah. out, I guess, yeah. Yeah, and that's a, that's a very great point. So usually the rule of thumb is when there are nutritional deficiencies or we can identify that they're at risk for nutritional deficiencies because it is so extreme. You know, there has been probably a lot of speculation about how many numbers of foods need to be involved when we think about balanced diet. Like they have to have at least four different fruits that are eating or five different proteins that they're eating. So this can vary. What we have seen is if anything less than having, you know, four less than having five different varieties of a food, it's going to put anybody, a child at risk or an adult. And so we're really looking for number one variety when we're talking about nutritional deficiencies, being able to meet those nutritional requirements for that growing child. If they're able to meet it in other ways, that's great. And they may be on their growth trajectory and going just fine. But when we're looking at the variety, if they're having enough variety in their diet where they're gonna be able to facilitate that um, in different environments, you know, that definitely could be a risk. So when we're looking at nutritional deficiencies, one of the big ones that we do see in pediatrics is going to be anemia. Mm -hmm. um, low protein stores specifically from heme protein or animal protein. So that is definitely if we have a child and mom and dad are saying, you know, they're just a picky eater. They just don't eat meat. They just don't eat chicken. And now it's becoming a medical problem where their labs are showing that they're deficient. Then it's time to intervene and, and assess and use criteria whether this is something that is selective and picky that is a normal trajectory that they may grow out of or indeed this is something that's a little bit deeper rooted and needs a little bit more attention and time to get them to follow or eat in a way that'll help them maintain health and prevent those nutritional deficiencies. So I guess then like in that approach, cause I would think a lot of parents maybe come to this, you know, picky eating is a very common concern among parents. And so, um, you know, as a first step, what do you kind of suggest as sort of assessing the situation. Are they saying, you know, is my kid just a normal picky eater? Or, you know, what do I do? Because to me too, that the concerns start to become when you start to see um, health consequences of the way your child is eating, a lot of times that increases the stress. And for a lot of parents, um, I find it will it will often increase the behaviors that sometimes reinforce picky eating. So we get, you know, kind of like you said, with the iron deficiency anemia, you get those, uh, you know, young kids that are drinking a ton of milk because you know they don't eat but they drink their milk and then we just right. see it creating this sort of iron deficiency anemia and yes. um you know it's sort of a chicken and an egg sort of self-perpetuating circumstance so i guess if people are if little flags are going off to parents saying like does is this what i'm dealing with what are kind of right. first steps that you suggest for parents so the first step would be definitely to talk to your PCP or your pediatrician about checking in on their 
not only growth trajectory, but also some of the questionnaires that are out there that are specific for ARFID. So just recently, within the last year, there became a questionnaire, um, the PARDI, which is P-A-R-D-I. And this is a very sensitive questionnaire that assesses for pediatric population some of the behaviors that are associated with ARFID. So it helps them screen. So any provider really can use that, whether it be their therapist or a specialist, um, their pediatrician. But you know, seeking out help from a provider, uh, whether it be a psychologist, psychiatrist, or your primary, your pediatrician, um, how, they can utilize some questionnaires that'll better help them. It's also accessible online. There are some parent questionnaires that you can utilize. So there's the cheat, which is the child's eating attitude test. Um, and that's how your child believes um, or perceives food. So it can give us a little bit more insight on what's going on. And that can range from anywhere from two years old till 18. So there's lots of different questionnaires that can be utilized to help you gain a little bit more understanding about what your child is feeling or the behaviors that they're exhibiting that can give indication whether this is selective eating, picky eating, or indeed this is ARFID. Um, and, and definitely, like I said, if we're coming to the point where it's interfering with social psychodynamics, they're avoiding going to uh, soccer practice mm -hmm. because it's be a team meeting and there's gonna be pizza there and they're afraid if they're there, how they're gonna react around eating pizza or if somebody's gonna pressure them to eating pizza if there's interference in them being able to focus in school, right? It's now become a problem because they're dreading going to the lunch table or they're, you know, avoiding eating in the situation at the cafeteria because they are struggling with either knowing when to eat, understanding how to manage that anxiety around the food, or they're just not hungry and that becomes a bigger problem and we start to see that. But usually we're looking at, you know, using those questionnaires as a, a rule of thumb um, and getting screened by your provider for any growth or deficiencies. Usually when we see a deficiency in their blood work, a nutritional deficiency, or we see their growth trajectory go down, they become failure to thrive or they're losing weight or they're not gaining height the impact of that malnutrition has already been done. Mm -hmm. So if we wait to that point, it, it, you know, it kind of is already in motion. We want to intervene before it gets to that point. Mm -hmm. So really looking for the signs of anxiety around food and eating and food situations is one of the things I would tell parents to look for. And then also look for the variety in which they're eating to change or to be very limited. Um, so if, you know, you have a kiddo that maybe was eating goldfish and crackers and potatoes and rice, and now is only eating goldfish and crackers, that would warrant looking further in and saying, well, they did eat this before. Why are they not eating this now? Got it. Well, and I like what you said, um, because in general, I always think that the instances that you brought up, for example, like the child not wanting to go to soccer practice, not wanting to go to the birthday party because they're worried about the food that's gonna be served. Granted, that's usually something you're able to see in a little bit older kids, but I always say, you know, that's a red flag to me that this is something that they feel out of control of because it's starting to interfere with things that they want to do and they feel like the anxiety or um, this situation for them is something so difficult for them to control that they can't even do the things that they want to do. So I love pointing that out because I think that can be an excellent just sort of red flag where you're like you're starting to not even do the things you want to do because this is becoming such an issue for you. Um, right. But then the other thing that you said, you know, I think as a practitioner too, I think what can be difficult is that sort of um, discerning where you're talking about, is this a situation where, uh, you know, this sort of picky eating has been perpetuated versus, um, you know, where it's gotten worse because it's something kind of like inherently difficult for the child has gotten worse. And so, you know, I guess maybe maybe that's just a lot of history taking too and understanding what the parents have tried and sort of what's the eating environment. But to me, that raised the question, sort of are there known risk factors for developing ARFID? Um, and if so, then what are those? 
Yeah, so we there definitely are risk factors. When we talk about risk factors, we can kind of narrow it down into a couple of groups. We know that a very high percentage of the population with ADHD or that have autism or on the spectrum are at risk to develop ARFID. And there's a lot of speculation, a lot of talk out there about you know, neurodivergent children and sensory with eating. When it becomes a problem, when it is interfering with their growth, right? Whatever is part of that presentation, mm -hmm. that can develop into an eating disorder, which would be categorized under ARFID. So any, any child with um, neurological problems or defects definitely would be at risk. Um, we do know children that have a history of depression, anxiety, they would be at risk because of think about how the use of food and eating is a control factor. It can be kind of also stem from, you know, a maladaptive coping skill. So if you have a child that has, you know, extreme worry and their tummy hurts, which is part of that anxiety uh, presentation, certainly they're associating the food because they're not able to eat. And so that can be created from that as well. Um, any trauma. So when we talk about trauma, it doesn't always have to be the big T traumas. It can also be something as simple as getting sick if they had the flu or stomach flu and were hospitalized for an extended period of time. There can be a rebound time where they don't want to have that same pain or they fear how food will react in their body. And that can develop into an eating disorder as well. Um, so, you know, dental work, I've had clients that have had H. pylori or have had, you know, a GI bug that as a result of that chronic dehydration and needing intervention have developed a, you know, selective eating pattern that has resulted in ARFID. So those are the big criteria, I think, that put children and put people at risk for developing um, ARFID. It, are there things that you can do to reduce the risk that your child would develop something like this, especially if you're starting to maybe get suspicious? I mean, that you're just even on just kind of the picky eating spectrum. Are there things you can do to maybe reduce the risk that your child would develop ARFID? Yeah. So if you think that maybe there's some behaviors beginning and you're not sure whether it's picky eating, selective eating or ARFID, you know, the number one, despite the the label or despite the diagnosis, the number one thing you can do is model good behavior. Um, it, you know, no matter what the situation is, is if you're modeling good behavior around dinner time or around eating, that's going to set the tone of how they're going to look at how their behavior should be addressed. So if mom and dad dislike a food and they're making signs of disgust and they're talking negatively about the food, that child's gonna pick up on that. And that might be something that plays into and grows their rejection of the food. So modeling good behavior, I think, and modeling expectations around food and around eating are, you know, invaluable when it comes to preventing eating disorders in general. Mm -hmm. I do think approaching food and approaching physiological reactions in a neutral situation is going to help tremendously. So a lot of times we want to teach our kids, you know, table manners on how to behave. And so we have these two extremes sometimes going on where, you know, we may tell them to sit down and use a fork and chew them with their mouth closed. Um, and then you have the other end of the spectrum where if you have a child that we just want to get them to eat, we're mm -hmm. pulling our hair out and we just want to get them to eat, we may be able to accept those things that they're doing around eating. It may be throwing food, there may be spitting food out, right? So if we're giving mixed messages and we're pointing out that these things are a problem, but we're not giving them great guidance on how to manage it or what you expect from them, um, that can lead them to continue th that behavior or be unsure how to act. So giving them tools and telling them, you know, it's okay not to like food. It's okay for food to feel funny in your mouth. It's okay to spit food out if you're unsure, but to teach them how to do that in a, a way where they feel in control and that there's clear information across the board on how to behave or what to do will give them that power back so they feel a lot more confident with eating and lowers that anxiety threshold. And I really, I wanna get back to this idea of sort of how you approach treating it, 
um, at all levels. But I think first, what I really was hoping to clarify with you is, is this something, I know it's something that can get diagnosed in adults, but is it generally something that you will have seen started in childhood or is this something that could even, I mean, I suppose there's always one-offs, but in general, is it something where this has been an issue for you since you were probably a small child? Or do you see sort of events or things um, that happen where you actually just don't really see this occurring until later in life? Like, I guess to me, it's sort of like if I get my kid to a teenager and he's not having this problem, is it unlikely that he's going to develop this problem or how does that work? Yeah. Yeah, so when we did research on onsets of eating disorders, and we're we're not kind of talking about like um, acute onsets, we know that the onset age, median age is about eight years old, and it is chronic and enduring. So if somebody has ARFID, it's not going to go away. They're not gonna grow out of it. With selective eating and picky eating, the, this comes, it waxes and wanes. You'll have this self-autonomy age at six and seven that they wanna be able to say yes and no and how much to eat. And then it'll go off a little bit and it'll be more on choosing the foods, right? ARFID is chronic. It starts at eight with mm -hmm. food refusal and it continues to be a problem throughout teenagehood. Usually it's going to peak around that early age, eight, nine, 10, 11, um, and, and definitely through the teen years as they become more uh, self-autonomous and want more control over food, but it carries over into adulthood as well. If, if an adult is diagnosed with it, it usually is a one-off situation where you know it's unlikely that they hadn't presented some of these behaviors early in life, but that they're only coming to terms with it now and recognizing it. But most of the time when we're looking at ARFID um, in the true sense of, of an, a, a true diagnosis by that criteria, we're seeing it very young. We're seeing at eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. I'm actually surprised. I guess my, my thought was maybe that it was even like as younger children. And maybe because that's where you really feel like the peak of the picky eating concerns are these sort of like preschool, when it's sort of developmentally very, very common. So maybe that's another, and I would guess that, you know, a lot of these kids have some history of that, whether it was normal at that point or not. Um, but that's interesting actually that you're seeing that peak more around eight. And is that just because that's an age at which most children have maybe turned a corner in terms of picky eating and these kids go off the rails the other way? Yes. So we all know that there is a time, like you mentioned before, that picky eating or what we think about picky eating is a normal part of child development. And so when somebody comes to, you know, a treatment center or comes to me and says, hey, my four year old or my five year old won't eat kale. To me, I would say, well, unless there is a pediatric feeding disorder present, and there's any malfunctioning going on with like normal chewing and swallowing, we might approach that as maybe selective or just, you know, a normal growth trajectory and kind of address it. But if it is not kind of teetering out around that eight year old eight range and it's getting worse and not better, that's when we would say, okay, this m may be ARFID. So, you know, a lot of times when we're comparing picky eating to ARFID, there's usually the element of anxiety where there isn't the element of anxiety with picky eating. They may be totally fine with all of their other preferred foods and only show reservation around the food that they are rejecting. With ARFID, you're going to see, you know, anxiety all over the place, not only with the rejected food, but also with preferred foods. That whole eating, the, the idea of eating, sitting at a table, um, that is anxiety provoking because they're having such a stressful time. So, you know, if you're looking at comparing pediatric, normal, you know, picky eating to ARFID, usually you're going to see that is one of the differences. It's not bothering the child. They're not avoiding social situations. They're still interacting with other kids that are maybe eating that food that they're trying to avoid, right? Whereas if it's ARFID or you suspect even at an early age, you're gonna see some of those behaviors. There's going to be an underlying thread, whether it be a certain texture taste that they have been rejecting, or it's the complaints of like, he can go all day without eating. I don't know why he's never showing signs of hunger, 
or there's that anxiety aspect of kind of getting really worked up or throwing a tantrum or really, you know, getting very kind of um, heightened anxiety around the act of eating. So, and I think it's an important distinction that we kind of touched on earlier, but like as opposed to what most of us think of as eating disorders, you know, the anorexia, the bulimia, the binge eating disorders, um, you know, it's a very important distinction that this doesn't seem to have anything uh, to do specifically with uh, body image or trying to control uh, the size of their body or caloric intake or anything like that, correct? Absolutely. There is what they would call ARFID plus, where it's kind of a chicken or the egg. Um, you know, usually rule of thumb is if there's any body image underlying body image beliefs going on or talk about other than food neutral, like this food is bad, this food is good, then we would really look into a deeper level and see is this indeed more of an orthorexic behavior, right. which is subcategories, or if this would be anorexia or bulimia or possibly binge eating. But it isn't uncommon for somebody with ARFID to also develop an additional eating disorder. So anybody with an eating disorder, any child with an eating disorder is at risk to develop more eating disorders. So if you have a child that maybe isn't exhibiting body image, um, isn't complaining about food being good or bad, and we take the approach of trying to help them or getting them help and they start to become over aware or hyper aware of eating, this also could develop into an eating disorder. So it's very important because this is such a unique eating disorder that we, you know, tackle it from, from a perspective of this is, you know, very unique. We need to find the people out there that know what they're doing. And it seems, though, with ARFID, like the anxiety is really centered around the discomfort with mm -hmm. the food itself. Is that correct? I mean, can you kind of describe, I'm sure people have kind of described to you the way that they feel when they either like have to feel like they are forced to be near or even try to eat foods that they're not comfortable with. Like what, what do people describe in those kind of scenarios? Yeah, so there's there's three main subtypes of ARFID. There is avoidant, there is restrictive, there's aversive. So, you know, when we think about avoidant, this is the category of a child that maybe doesn't have hunger and fullness cues that are really accurate or work. And so for them, they may not be viewing feeling physically full as a positive thing. Their body may view that as something that is like a warning sign. Right, so when a child is talking about it's distressful or it's upsetting or they're getting very anxiety is heightened by having to eat when they are not hungry, they may describe that as you know feeling overly full or feeling nauseous. And so this is a physical feeling, um, how they feel in their body, more of an interception kind of feeling. Um, stomach might hurt, they may feel distended. In all reality, that is not you know, overly full to them, that's what it feels like. So a lot of complaints, GI complaints may be that my kid gets full really easily and they're really not growing and I don't know what else to do. They don't take the pediatrician, they don't take the supplement. How can I help them? They're, they're getting full very fast. So that might be one of the things that would trigger you to kind of think and say, hey, they're having distress with eating and eating enough for their body. Um, when we're talking uh, about more of the aversive, you would think about child that has a fear of choking or a fear of the bo bodily harm from the food, right? So that might be the child that got sick one time on macaroni and cheese. And now every time she's near macaroni and cheese, she starts to feel overwhelmed. She might sweat. There may be heart palpitations. Her stomach would hurt getting a knots. There might be residual fear, even if she does eat it of like, hey, my belly hurts. You know, is the mac and cheese going to make me sick again? Um, so distress from a GI standpoint is not uncommon. Um, and then we have that category of, you know, more of the sensory aversions um, that would be avoidant in the sense of like, I can't tolerate fruits and vegetables. I can't tolerate mushy foods. That a lot of the distress will be felt in their mouth. So they may feel like there's this gag reflex where a lot of kids say that they can't swallow it. 
um, or they can't chew it. So that might be something that you work with an OT, occupational therapist or speech language pathologist around, is feeling comfortable enough where they're able to allow their body to swallow the food. Um, and then checking in and doing some CBT work with a therapist on, hey, how does your body feel? So a lot of the distress is either GI, they're feeling in their stomach, they're feeling it in their mouth, they're feeling it in their neck, they may get a headache, they may feel overwhelmed stress-wise. That's um, that's very interesting. I think it's nice to just kind of hear, like, what is the actual experience that these kids are having? Because I think, that, and I'm sure that that's the same experience the adults are having as well, which I think, you know, on one end too, I think it's also important to note to have those feelings in those scenarios as an adult, I feel like there's a little bit more empathy or sympathy for kids. Uh, with an adult, I'm guessing it becomes a little bit even more difficult socially because people are like, come on, like just eat the food, right? So um, I, I would guess like getting to be into adulthood without having the situation treated could actually be quite quite the mental struggle. But what I wanted to move on to, because we talked to, about this a little bit earlier, was really your approach to how do we how do we treat these kids? How do we treat these people? Because the things that you described, uh, really a, a lot of it, what you've talked about so far, is kind of the approach that we suggest, you know, with any kid with about picky eating and helping them kind of become confident, competent eaters, helping them become more adventurous eaters, just the attitude you're modeling, sort of this neutral approach to the food, um, making sure the foods that, the safe foods or the foods they like are available. Um, but I always feel like as, you know, as a pediatrician, a lot of times when you're dealing with what you'd consider normal picky eating, you can lean on for the parents that they're growing okay, they're doing okay. You know what I mean? I feel like it's that piece, that that confidence, if you can kind of reassure the parents, we're doing okay, and that can kind of help you stay the course for these behaviors that sometimes can seem counterintuitive when you're really anxious. So now you've got parents that are dealing with kids that probably actually are having some medical consequences, actually having some growth difficulties, um, some nutrition deficiencies. So you don't have that piece. And so I think it must be even more difficult to sort of give them that like stay the course uh, right. attitude. So how do you how do you approach treating these kids? There There is a couple of different um, approaches that I've kind of wove into together to help parents, because ultimately when we're talking about refeeding and we're talking about helping your child through an eating disorder, a bulk of that work falls upon the parent. Mm -hmm. because the parent has to facilitate that and it can be exhausting. So usually the approach I take is I inter, I kind of take Ellen Satter is division's responsibility, who is the dietitian who kind of developed this protocol on how we should model good behavior for eating. Oh, yeah, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> some of that and kind of using some traditional eating disorder um, modeling for that to also happen and a little bit of Maudsley. Maudsley's technique is the uh, technique we would use for a different type of eating disorder such as anorexia or bulimia where the parents are really taking over the role and letting the child work on other aspects of recovery and saying let us let us show you, let us guide you on how much you should be eating, what you should be eating. Let us take over that role because you're not able to make those good decisions with an eating disorder. This is vastly different when we have somebody with ARFID. It's not that they don't wanna make sound decisions, even as a child. It's that there are they feel incapable of doing it. So I have a lot of kids that might smell something and be like, that smells so good, but I, I just can't eat it. So the first thing that we establish with parents is giving them, like I said, modeling good behavior, having a routine, sticking with that routine. So, you know, it might be simply working with the foods that they are accepting. This is the big exception where we're talking about eating disorder work. You might challenge somebody who maybe has an orthorexic behavior or, or anorexia and saying, this isn't good food or bad food, it's just food and you can eat it. Somebody with ARFID, they know that. They know it's no good food or bad food, but they feel that there's a block there preventing them from eating it. So we're gonna work, especially the child that is at risk for malnourishment, we're gonna work with the foods that they're already accepting. So establishing and having foods that they already are accepting at regular intervals. So that might mean at breakfast, if they're taking nothing but carbs, 
right? We're going to give them all the carbs they want because the growth is the most important thing. And as you mentioned before, sure, they could be growing on the growth trajectory. They could be on their growth chart and get all their calories from carbs, right? Mm -hmm. If they're already doing that, right, then we can do the work of adding more variety. But if we aren't even there and they are now malnourished or underweight or at risk of losing weight because we've tried to get them to eat the fruits, we've tried them to get to eat the meat. And in place of that, they aren't eating. And so we're kind of backing down on that growth. We're gonna try to get them back up to a goal weight using the foods they already eat. Mm -hmm. Once they're fully nourished, right? and they're getting enough and they're getting it consistently that's usually when we start to see hunger and fullness cues because the stomach is working the body has enough nutrition to produce leptin and ghrelin which cue the body how much weight to gain how to grow and so that's when we would start saying hey let's work on food exposures so the model i use is i use food exposures a lot of this is based off of Dr. Zucker's food lab at a Duke University, and she has this fantastic program just for ARFID, just for children and parents that are struggling with ARFID in kind of having the t kid tie in and buy into like, hey, you're a food explorer. You are a food scientist. Let's really delve into what this food is about. Letting the child have that food in their hand and play with it and kind of assess it without pressure to eat it or try it is the biggest tie-in, I would say. So once my approach is, once we get them eating something and eating on a regular basis, then we can start working on adding variety. There's many different ways that somebody might do that. Um, what I normally recommend is you have to work with a dietitian to really assess what food group or what foods are the most important for us to work in. Um, it is, it can be very tiring um, for a kiddo to be working on meat or working on uh, one fruit um, and every day have a different challenge. So really focusing on what is this child's nutritional concern? Are they deficient or at risk for deficiency in maybe animal protein? Or maybe they don't have any vegetables in their diet, right? That's where I would focus on, hey, how can we work on getting some vegetables in? Do we want to do food exposures? Meaning we're going to focus just on one vegetable and we're going to give them very small amounts every other day, three times a week, just for them to get comfortable enough where maybe they're smelling it or maybe they're tasting it. Mm -hmm. But it's consistency in the message that you're giving them that makes it successful. So if you're just trying one food one day and trying a new food the next day, you're not going to make any progress. So, you know, with children of any age, whether they're six or they're 18, having a very definitive kind of line of what you're gonna work on and why you're gonna work on it and letting them be involved in that exploration is going to be helpful. But is that something you talk about with the child? Because like, again, you know, I think a lot of times as I relate to that, a lot of the idea of exposures, you know, that's something we'll talk about with kids in general, maybe not so much like we're not like, you know, broccoli is happening and we're going to do broccoli every day until we get it. You know, usually it's more like just the idea of having various foods on the table. Um, but, you know, and then this idea of kind of being neutral and not talking about the food. However, like you said, you know, in these situations where perhaps you have kids that are understanding, like, I would like to be able to eat these foods. Like, is it do you then have more of the discussions that maybe you wouldn't have with kids otherwise, you know, about saying like, well, that that's why we're doing this. Um, especially as you get to older kids, I feel like, you know, if I was 18, I'd be like, I get why broccoli's on the table every day because we're working on this. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, a lot of children that do have ARFID are not normally, I would say, buying into getting better and that mm -hmm. that's where the, the difficulty comes in because you there's only a there's a fine line of how much you want to push a kid mm -hmm. so a lot of times i kind of present it as hey this is the bare minimum that we need to be able to eat in order for you to grow to be healthy and so we want to work together as a team to get you there i don't need you necessarily eating kale and quinoa and like all these other things but if they're not receptive to working on a food, 
if they feel overwhelmed with it. That also indicates we should probably back up and work more with a therapist on anxiety mm -hmm. and using the coping skills before we even tackle doing some of the food work. So you, sometimes they may bring in like reward charts or they may bring in other means of like non-food um, kind of rewards or incentives. And that usually will work well because let's face it, at six years old, at seven years old, at eight years old, that's the last thing they should be worrying about yeah. is whether this food is going to make me grow or not. They should be learning to enjoy food and understand their body. And so we want to take a little bit of that pressure off. So there is a fine line of what we would discuss with the child and what we would discuss with the parent. I love that. Well, thank you. This has been super useful. I think that this is, I'm very happy to be helping to get the message out about this because like I said, I think this is a eating disorder that's not well known and I think kind of poorly understood. So um, I really love the work that you're doing. If this is resonating with some of us who are listening, what's the best way to get in contact with you so we can get more information? Sure. So you can head to my website, which is Rebecca Thomas Nutrition LLC.com. Um, and we have a number of resources uh, that are available for ARFID. Um, there's also on Instagram a lot of resources under Food Freedom Nutritionist. Um, if we can't provide some information for you, we have plenty of contacts who can. Um, but definitely contact me on the website or contact me on Instagram. We can definitely give you more information on what types of services and what's out there to help those with our fit. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Feeding the Family. If you're loving these episodes, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and we'll see you here next week.